If you go back to the early parts of the investigation, uh, we're, we're back in February and March, and we didn't know, we didn't have an idea of who um, any of the suspects were, and we were literally looking at a, you know, a thousand plus names. Um, the day we made the arrest uh, for the sexual assaults, we had a very good idea that he was responsible um, for some of the homicides. Hello, I'm Councilman Dave Siebert. Welcome to On the Issues, On the Road. I'm here at Phoenix Police Headquarters, 620 West Washington Street with Phoenix Police Chief Jack Harris. Chief, Phoenix Police Department has been very busy lately. Yes, we have. Let's talk about some of the violent serial cases that have been going on for the last couple of years. Sure, in the past two years we have had actually three series of very violent criminals that have been stalking our community. The first one started with the AM rapist that, as you know, was hitting uh, victims all over the valley, but mostly concentrated in North Phoenix. Uh, then we also had, uh, just subsequent to that, two other serial crimes that were occurring. One was Mark Dudeau, uh, which resulted in nine homicides around the valley, and the other was the random shootings that we just concluded at this time. You know, most people don't realize that very few major cities, or any cities, as a matter of fact, have this many serial violent cases going on at approximately the same time, or a few of them at the exact same time. That's true. Uh, most major cities have had something similar to one of these, but I don't know of any other city in the country that's had three of these types of cases going at almost the same time. In fact, as I recall on the AM rapist, which was concluded some time ago, that uh, the suspect actually got out of his vehicle, was identified by a uh, female Phoenix police officer, and uh, called in. So, so your statistical analysis of, of where the person would strike was so good that the person actually got out of their vehicle next to a, a detective. That was correct. Uh, that was interesting, not only for the circumstances of what happened, but also the fact that those officers, including that particular officer, had been out there on surveillance for months, sitting in a car at the same locations, waiting for uh, someone to come around that looks suspicious to them, and to have the guy actually pull up and park next to the surveillance vehicle and get out and head towards the victim was absolutely amazing. Well, Chief, you know, we, we always know that you know, statistical analysis and putting your resources, which are limited, you know, in the best places possible, it doesn't get any better than that. And th then we go to the next case, the, the, uh, the serial shooters. Uh, many violent crimes committed had certainly our community on edge for quite some period of time. And you found uh, the suspects, apprehended them, and now they're in the judicial system. Exactly. And really, in talking to the public, I try to emphasize, think about what actually happened here involving this department. We had two guys that live in a population of over four million people valley-wide. We had no clue as to who these people were, and the investigators were able to track those folks down, uh, come up with a complete investigation that resulted in the arrest of those uh, two people. It's absolutely phenomenal work by our folks. And then going on at the same time as that was, was the Mark Godot case. And let's talk about uh, the amount of charges you're going to send over to the county attorney. Yes, uh, the detectives are submitting 71 different charges uh, on Mr. Godot, including nine homicides, eight that occurred in Phoenix, and one that occurred in the uh, city of Tempe. So you're talking 71 violent crimes from one individual. One individual. You know, you've always said that, that a small number of people do the vast majority of the crime, and this is an example of that very statement. Yeah, really, all three of, three of these cases are perfect examples of that theory. Well, Chief, I tell you what, your folks have done a great job. If you will tell them thank you from all of us on the city council, appreciate all the good work. We absolutely will. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chief. For me to sit here and say that there was no bumps in the road, 
after all these months, you know, that's not accurate. There's always going to be bumps in the road. But I got to tell you, the city of Phoenix, the people of the city of Phoenix have to know that there was, this was a first class operation, um, the best I've seen since I've been here, and the best leadership that was running it. With me now is Assistant Chief Kevin Robinson. Chief, I uh, appreciate all the work that you and your folks have done on these uh, serial cases that have been going on, but let's talk about the last couple of years and your role in really bringing the team together and the amount of officers and, and crime techs that you had to have working on these cases. Okay, well, like you said, it, it does go back a while. If you go back as far as last summer when we dealt with the double homicide at the subway restaurant over in West Phoenix, and that took a whole lot of folks. And if you remember, there's very little information, but you know, we had to bring a lot of folks together, all the detectives and the support personnel who were able to follow up with the little information that we had and brought that to a successful conclusion. Shortly thereafter, we recognized that we had a serial rapist. And this is a guy who was hitting from as far south as Ahwatukee and as far north as, the, um, nor as North Mountain. And in that, I mean, we had a, just very little information using crime analysis and that, and that process. We were able to put out teams of surveillance officers all over the, all over the city for that matter. And with that, we were successful. Good old-fashioned police work. We arrested that guy, and he has since taken a plea agreement, and he'll never see the light of day. He'll be in jail for the next 60 years of his life. So at the tail end of that, we had a couple of incidents that turned into our serial shooter. And obviously, again, that was a situation where the public um, voiced their concerns. Everyone had some issues, and, and understandably so. And the police department, with the support of uh, the city hall, folks over at city hall, yourself included, from public safety and subcommittee, they were able to, everyone was able to give us what we needed, the support that we needed, and with that, we were able to put more people out on the street. And what I mean by that is just the, the amount of surveillance that we did. I was able to pull folks first from my division, the investigations division, pull them from the Drug Enforcement Bureau, and that's all of our, drug, our street drug squads, our conspiracy squads, our airport squad, our um, the vice units. And not to say we just forgot all those other responsibilities. Our folks really stepped up to the plate, and what they did was they, they worked double duty. It wasn't unusual for us to expect people to work seven days a week, right. 12 hours a day. And a lot of overtime. A ton of overtime. And again, that, the support that we were given, clearly the message was, the, the community is going to be safe. Do what it takes. You can't put a price tag on good, solid investigation work and police work. And, and that's what we did. And we moved forward from there. As we were in the middle of the serial shooter investigation, it became clearer and clearer to us that Mark Goodell, the Mark Goodell investigation started building on itself. So we had two serial investigations at the same time. And as the research I've done and talked to my colleagues or peers across the country, Police agencies, that's, that's, that's a that difficult happen, task. Right. It does not happen. Two serial cases at the same time, we were able to pull it off. We were able to bring in more people. And at the height of it, and you, you know this, we had about 300 officers working surveillance, follow-up, the investigation itself. and That's we about 10% about of the entire police force. That's exactly right. They were out there day in and day out doing what needed to be done. We were successful and were able to apprehend Hausner and Dietman for the serial shooters. We then focused all of our attention on the Godot investigation. And in doing so, all the pieces just kept coming together. And I can't say enough positive things about the officers, the detectives, the crime lab folks, the people who really made this investigation happen. They did an awesome job. They it, really did. They did. And, and, you, and you, you understand how, you know, just the, the hours that they worked, uh, the amount of work, the technical review, everything that they had to do. And they employed a surveillance strategy or an investigative strategy a lot that we haven't done around here before, but they well, ran by us. Take, taking it to the next level, and so the next time something like this happens, uh, you're even more prepared than you were before. Yeah, and that's the unfortunate thing. It, there will be a next time. With the technology, we're able to link these cases a lot quicker. We think that, you know, there are some folks who are responsible for a lot of the crime, and we're going to be able to address those issues and go after those folks more aggressively. Chief Robinson, thank you very much no, for all your you. work. Thank Appreciate all the it. folks out there. We will. Thank you. The person that was responsible for this, in my opinion, was very good at what he did. He, he we believe that uh, wherever he got that knowledge, he had knowledge of forensics, I believe. 
I think he had knowledge of general police procedures. So we were not after a dummy. We knew someone, the person we were going after knew what he was doing. I'm here with Tracy Montgomery at Phoenix Police Headquarters. Tracy, you're the assistant chief now. Congratulations on your uh, recent you. promotion. It was certainly great to work with you at Cactus Park Precinct as a commander. But now you're over the crime lab. And, you know, I just had a chance to talk to Chief Harris about some of the very heinous crimes that have been committed, some of the serial killers and rapists that were out there. And I know that a significant part of those cases have to be coming from the crime lab and the analysis that are done by your great people. Let's, let's talk about the folks and, and the work that goes into solving cases like these. Well, sure. As you know, we have a full-service crime lab. Uh, we uh, are self-supporting with all of our services. Uh, we had to because the sheer volume of uh, uh, evidence that we did in just this latest serial case uh, asked for DPS for some assistance in, in uh, handling the volume of, of, of evidence. Um, we certainly um, expect to hit 1,500 items with just the Mark Godot case alone. Uh, that's in addition to the items of evidence that we're processing for the serial shooter case as well as the AM uh, rapist case. So uh, we've got a quality team, one of the best here in the country, um, and we've got a $36 million crime lab that we're getting ready to move into uh, early 2007, and uh, we expect many more great things from our crime lab. Now you talk about 1,500 pieces of evidence. Give an example, let's say you had a shirt and you had to get some DNA off of it. How many hours might that take for that one item? That's a great question. Uh, there are many uh, phases of processing an item of evidence. Uh, we may look for trace evidence, hairs, lint, fibers, that sort of thing. We may look for biological evidence, uh, saliva, blood, something that's not exactly obvious. That requires a inch by inch close surveillance, if you will, of that clothing item. If we think we find a, a substance, then we do a, a chemical test to see if it's, it's tissues. From there, we may do another test. A single shirt could take 8 to 16 hours just to, to uh, do a cursory search on, and then we begin those other scientific processes. An item of evidence could be subject to three or four of the different sections in the crime lab's analysis, and we have to coordinate each one of those to make sure that the first, second, and third uh, analysis doesn't destroy anything that we might obtain in the fourth, fifth, and sixth. So You're saving enough so that in case the defense questions it, absolutely. you can go back and test it again and, yes. and verify everything that you've done. So, so one item theoretically could take eight to sixteen hours. Uh, it, 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 minimum, and, yes. And, and you literally had hundreds of items just on one case. We're we're over a th well over a thousand with just one case, and uh, you know a lot of questions have been asked about why all these these charges weren't charged at the same time. Certainly, as, as soon as we had one case to charge, the initial two-victim uh, sexual assault, uh, we had an opportunity to get a, a sexual assault suspect off the street. We did so, and that gave us a little bit of time to process a lot of this evidence and, and build uh, systematically these cases and support our investigators as they uh, uh, gathered you know, numerous uh, items of evidence. Well, I tell you what, great group of investigators, great Absolutely. group of lab technicians. If you could tell them all, thank you very much for the great work. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Assistant Chief Montgomery, congratulations. It's like a puzzle, and as your case goes on, and as, you're, as you follow up on leads, you get pieces of evidence, and sometimes that evidence, that day, you think at that moment that it's gonna be the piece of evidence that's gonna break the entire case. The next day you find that it's not that important, and really, you're gonna need a lot more pieces of the puzzle to even establish one case. In homicide, we get we become very close to our victims' families. When you uh, uh, are assigned a case in homicide as a detective, that case is yours. It's not the sergeants, it's not the lieutenants, it's not the captains, and it's not the chiefs of police. You are solely responsible. That's the way the department holds you accountable for that. And when you have one homicide assigned to you and you're dealing with one victim's family, you get close to that family. You're doing the job for that family. Now you compound that by the number of homicides and sexual assaults and armed robberies and you total up the victims we had on this. It gets very emotional and sometimes emotion, being emotional is bad but sometimes it's good. It motivates the investigators because our primary motivation is solving these crimes for these victims' families. 
With me is Kurt Messick, who is the forensic artist for the Phoenix Police Department. Kurt, thank you for all the good work you've done. I tell you what, your work is absolutely phenomenal. Thank you. Let's, let's look at some of these things that we have in front of us. Now, start with the first picture there. You have markers on a skull. What are you doing with that? It's a, a 2D reconstruction, uh, just basically taking a soft tissue uh, markers, putting it on the skull for uh, dimensions so we know how much uh, to bring out either the clay or, in this case, the drawing. Um, and so the second one is the drawing itself, 2D. Right. So you actually drew that over so it filled in the markers. Right, just a transfer overlay, drew that, and once I had completed it, and then we actually scanned that in, the actual drawing. And that drawing is what you eventually figured out was the person at the end. Yeah, through DNA, we were able to identify this is actually the, uh, the unknown. And so, in essence, that is the person. We don't know what happened to that person up in North Phoenix, but that is the person you started with, just a skull. That's all you had to work with. Right. And you ended up with that and actually made the positive ID yes. through DNA and, of course, your, your drawings. I was looking at your drawings earlier, and I noticed the broken nose, and we talked about that earlier. You were so accurate that you see the broken nose on your artist rendering, and then you go to the actual photograph of the individual, and you can see that you were very accurate on the fact that the nose was broken over to the right. Mm. Yeah, you can see in this area here, there's a, a definite scarring of bone. It's probably an accident of some sort that happened some time ago. So I drew that into the uh, actual drawing, and you can see here uh, the break and the curvature in, this, in the nose. And let's talk about these two other that you have here. This one, you've already done a 3D model. Yeah, this is a, uh, this is actual skull. This is 3D reconstruction, basically doing the same thing here with the soft tissue markers. Then once I've um, put in um, those markers, then I bring, put clay on it to bring it out and do it in a 3D format. And so you actually fill it in and, and put then, of course, the shape of what you think the hair would be and, and, and come up with actually a fairly close uh, artist rendering of what the skull is. So there is actual skull, human skull, underneath that. Clay. Right, right. We do. So some, some will actually do a plaster cast. Uh, I prefer doing the, the actual skull. Um, in, a, in a crime scene or, or just an unknown, you don't know what happened. You don't really know exactly maybe if you don't have hair to know the uh, style of hair or color or uh, length. Um, so you kind of, it does take some uh, artist liberty to, to fill that in, but there is so much science now that be, gives you the ability to be able to identify certain measurements for like soft tissue cartilage, the nose, the ears, things like that. And so you're going to do what you did on this one, you're going to do to this uh, bear skull. Right, right. How long does it take you to get from this point to this point? Um, right now, it, between... Uh, 50 and, and 100 hours, depending on what's what's there. Uh, this skull had uh, the ramus, the the side of the uh, the jawbone here, it was missing, and uh, so I had to use the measurements from the other side to try to build it up to hopefully get the the correct measurements so I could build from that. So there was whenever you have maybe a, a, a gunshot uh, to the head or something, and there's uh, fragmentation of the skull then it takes a lot more time to be able to put all that together and, and come up with a final result. Right. Well, I've seen some of the drawings that you've done, some of the composite drawings you do for the Phoenix Police Department. They're absolutely fantastic. I mean, very, very close. And so I think you've done a great job. Thank Keep you. up the good work and uh, look to see you on many more cases. Thank you very much. The amount of commitment that it takes to be able to solve a case like we've been talking about is tremendous. The Phoenix Police Department has many good detectives and officers that have put a tremendous amount of time and sacrifices from their life. To talk about that with me today is Commander Joe Klima. Commander, let's talk a little bit about just the incredible uh, officers that we have and the amount of dedication they did and, and the time that they took away from their families to help uh, bring successful conclusion to these cases. Yeah. Councilman, I think the key here is that personal dedication and professionalism. These, 
uh, detectives and officers um, literally were working seven days a week, some 12 hours a day, constantly on this case. Um, one of our case agents on one of our big serial cases, actually as, as the arrest was made, um, actually rented a, a hotel room down, downtown just so he could go get a couple hours sleep and come back and continue with collecting that evidence. But it didn't just stop with the detectives. Um, we used specialty officers um, as we managed this case. We wanted to make sure we didn't, we kept all the services out in patrol that were needed. So we went to specialty units um, and we brought some of them in. And some of these people were work, used to working days with weekends off and they were thrown in a situation where they had to work weekends, actually they had to work seven days, but they were working nighttime. Some of these officers were out in the neighborhoods looking for him on a nightly basis. Um, there's actually a plan, a strategy of being where we knew that this suspect might commit this crime. Um, and they were out there and then the cover cars and just looking for, for him. And, and, and so a lot of this extra manpower was actually taken from specialty details, so it really never affected the patrol, it never affected the calls for service and, and the response times. Now, you know what, our, we know our number one priority is to be out there. When somebody calls, we need to come. Um, so we never try to affect the patrol response at all. Actually, I don't think we ever have. Um, but we do have units that do special investigations, uh, drug investigations, vice investigations, and we were taking detectives from those environments and you know what, we weren't really taking them, they came willingly. They knew the importance of catching this person. Um, and so they willingly volunteered or they willingly, they came and they knew what they had to do. And when we all signed up to be police officers, we know, we really don't know when we have to work, night times, days, weekends. And um, we take that commitment when we come on. But you know, sometimes we're used to working days and now we're, we willingly volunteer for a detail. I know many of the detectives, they miss their, their, their children's baseball games, softball games, other family events but they know what our responsibilities are. They're really true professionals and well, they're dedicated. They certainly are. And you know, you look at uh, how many cities have had cases like these. I don't know of any that have had them occurring at the same time. And so to solve them this fast, that are this complicated, it shows you really had to have some really dedicated folks. And uh, I just want to thank all of them for all the hard work that they did because uh, from the chief on down, everybody did a fabulous job in bringing these cases to a successful conclusion. And you know what, it's nice um, being a commander in a leadership role. I know that when we need to get these things done, we have, well, almost 3,000 police officers out there that will step up to the plate. And this is, these, in, these investigations were clear examples of that. Great, great job to everybody. Thank you, Commander. Thank you. Appreciate it. You know, homicide isn't just, when someone get mur gets murdered, it's just not that person that gets murdered as the victim. Just like a sexual assault. It's just not the person that gets sexually assaulted as the victim. They have family members that are affected, and it's just a uh, snowballing effect that ruins people's lives, ruins families. So that's how serious these cases are. So being motivated for these cases are not hard.